So let's talk a little bit about kind of in some ways where this all started, or at least yes, the kind of thanks. catalyst for the for the Comcast story to kick off. And that was the, the judge's ruling on the AT&T transaction, the, the sort of the, the, the availability now of this kind of vertical transaction structure. Is that just a US story or is that something that's going to have an impact over here as well? Well, it was extraordinary in the US. It's the first time we've had a fully litigated vertical merger decision in over 40 years. So I think it's going to have repercussions in Europe. Um, Europe has probably been a little bit more critical of vertical mergers than the US, but but broadly, it's open to them. Um, so I think the, um, the last time the Europeans were successfully challenged was on the UPS uh, TNT decision, which ultimately was after the event, TNT had yep. been acquired by FedEx. But I think that was still also a warning shot that the regulators need to get their analysis right. Um, and I think we'll see maybe uh, parties more emboldened to take on the regulators on the back of uh, the, the uh, AT&T decision. What about protectionism in Europe? We've seen so much of that in the US and some other markets now. Do you see that playing out in Europe as well and kind of blocking M&A on those grounds? Yeah. What markets maybe? To my mind, that is the story over the next few years. Uh, the, uh, certain of the member states in Europe have been maybe more willing to take a, um, a, a slightly pro more aggressive protectionist stance. Germany, I think, is, has been out ahead. And to some extent, the EU is busy trying to um, put an umbrella around uh, what all the member states are, are doing. So they've announced their proposed screening mechanism, where basically they'll be able to give guidance on any transactions with a union interest. That is, good, that is going to be so broad that we might see ourselves back in sort of strategic yogurt wars or whatever. <laughs> but um, the known, yeah, I remember. <laughs> but I think that that that's forecast to come out later on this year and I think um, uh, on the back of that we might see a little bit more coordination across Europe in terms of how they're going to deal with uh, foreign investment. Can I, talk to you, uh, can I talk to you a little bit about asset prices? Asset prices are reasonably well elevated at the moment. Uh, not as elevated as they were but nevertheless there's nevertheless, to be a lot of money chasing assets and, and yeah. again I kind of want to bring this back to, to the media landscape. I, logically in certain ways if, if you kind of game game out what Comcast and Disney may end up doing with Sky. The logical thing in some ways would be to go, you have this, I'll have this, and we'll, we'll end up not overpaying for some of these assets. Yeah. The problem with that is that you've got, it's a lot of customers that Sky brings with it. And it's kind of one of these assets that doesn't come around very often. So do you think the kind of the game theory logic applies, or do you think they're gonna sit there and go, you know what, we want this too much, and as a result of which, Maybe that risk of overpaying is a risk we're prepared to take at this stage. Sometimes you can see players coming together. I mean, like on the Asciano uh, bid in Australia last year, that, 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 that ultimately that was the way that was resolved. But I, I, I think it's more the exception than the rule. And um, it's, it's quite, uh, there's quite a lot of issues for, for counter bidders to, to actually come together. Um, and as uh, particularly with the um, the regulatory dynamics, so never rule it out. But I I, I think uh, you, still the sort of the classic bidding war is how most of these big deals play out. And bringing it back to the UK, which has seen a lot of M and A action, but also in recent weeks Unilever has said that they're abandoning their UK yep. headquarters for just Amsterdam. Are you seeing that more long term effect of Brexit in that it is no longer a corporate hub for some of these really big companies and how does that play into m and Yeah, the, uh, I mean, the Unilever decision, I, I, th I suspect, wasn't greatly impacted by Brexit. Um, th 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 and um, that uh, clearly, the unification of the DLC, DLCs are always under pressure to unify. So I, 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 um, particularly when activist shareholders get involved, etc. So, uh, and Unilever obviously has a huge presence in, in, in both parts. But yeah. I think what we are starting to see within the UK landscape, uh, wherever there's a foreign investor element, particularly for the public companies, now the battle to demonstrate that jobs are going to be protected, headquarters are not going to be shifted around, that is key. So in some of the more recent announcements in the last seven or eight uh, months, you actually have to get to page three or four of the announcement to see the commercial terms because the first couple of pages are just purely about how jobs are going to be protected, um, uh, where tax revenues are going to be um, paid, etc. So I think that is the new dynamic and definitely Brexit 
it's having some impact on that. One of the big stories we've been focusing on is the demise of this private equity giant in the Middle East, Abraj. Yeah. How do you see that affecting emerging market investments and the broader private equity industry? Yeah, it's very sad. I've got a f I know a few people um, at Abraj, and it's very sad the predicament they find themselves in. Um, Obviously, they were a niche emerging market player and a very large and, um, uh, and up until recently, you'd argue, very successful one. I think still there are a lot of big private equity players who are focused on emerging markets, either through dedicated funds or through growth platforms. And I think in many ways, the returns that you can make if you get the emerging market investments right are just so disproportionately large uh, that I don't see this a sort of a hiccup in terms of emerging market M&A, but definitely uh, you have to convince your stakeholders that you're going to do them to the proper international standards. And I think the best players know that already, and, and broadly that is how I've seen emerging market deals being done over the last few years.